Four days after a devastating plane crash over Lake Coeur d'Alene, divers say they have finally recovered the last victim who was found today trapped in the underwater wreckage. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Whitney Ward. And I'm Tom Sherry. Crews working to recover two planes that crashed over Lake Coeur d'Alene last Sunday say their work could be wrapped up this weekend. This morning, the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office announced that its sonar team had located the final two victims from the crash site. Now, crews will work to remove the two planes that were involved in the crash from the bottom of the lake. Krem 2's Taylor Vido has been following this story from the beginning. He joins us now live with the latest. Taylor. Well, Tom, this afternoon crews were preparing to launch a couple of barges from a boat launch not far from where the crash happened. Their first priority will, re will excuse me, will be removing the Cessna that has the final victim trapped inside. We have some video to show you this afternoon from the Lofts Bay boat ramp on the western side of Lake Coeur d'Alene. We saw a fairly large crane preparing to go out on the water. As of earlier this afternoon, they hadn't made it to the crash site not far from Powderhorn Bay yet, but that could have changed by now, certainly. As we've reported, crews have so far recovered seven of the eight victims involved in the crash. The final victim is trapped in the wreckage of the Cessna. So the goal now is for crews to meticulously remove that plane. And in another notable development, the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office says that the recovery team is hoping to be wrapped up in just two days. Getting the planes out will depend on several factors, though, and weather certainly could be one of them. They also recognize that boat traffic this weekend will pick up, and they're asking people to avoid that area on the lake. The key today is, is, is to get that plane up and recover that victim as well, and that'll be the last of the eight. The two planes are about 100 yards apart from each other, but here's the thing. The debris field is about 500 feet in diameter. Now, the sheriff's office says that crews won't be able to fully recover every single piece of debris there on the lake floor. They're certainly going to do their best and try and get everything they can. But the sheriff's office says they were told by the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, that the agency is hoping to get about three quarters to 80 percent of the wreckage up from the bottom of the lake. Reporting live in Coeur d'Alene, Taylor Vido, Grand 2 News. Thank you, Taylor. Kelly Krieger, who was on the Cessna plane during the Coeur d'Alene crash, is being remembered as an aviation enthusiast. She is from Rockland, California. As Giacomo Luca found, she has been working to preserve World War II stories. Family and friends remember Kelly Krieger as being larger than life. Rockland City Councilman Joe Patterson knows the retired Placer County employee for helping a lot in her community and for bringing American hero Bud Anderson to a Patriots Day celebration. Though the 98-year-old decorated World War II fighter pilot just called her friend. Well, she was very cheerful and uh, very positive. Uh, gosh, she had all these ideas. Krieger was an aviation enthusiast known for overwhelming kindness, who befriended the disabled veteran at the Auburn Air Show six years ago. She later helped him travel across the nation to share his story. She was the president of my fan club. 12-year-old Lindsay Jacobson is a super fan, but not just of Bud's. I don't know how I can sum up her personality except for, you know, it was big. Um, the impression she left on me was, you know, everything is possible no matter how chaotic and stressful it is. Krieger was believed to be a passenger on one of the planes that collided Sunday over in Idaho Lake. Family members say she died doing what she loved. Krieger was 61. So here's what we know about the plane crash victims. Sean Fredrickson, his son and two stepchildren were in the seaplane along with pilot Neil Lunt and one other person who has not yet been identified. Jay Colley and Kelly Krieger were in the Cessna and on their way to Lewiston. New details now about a shooting yesterday in East Central Spokane. Investigators say that the witnesses, as well as the uh, victim, that they are not cooperating in their investigation tonight. So here's what we know. Police say that someone called 911 yesterday afternoon about a man trying to get into a home covered in blood. They found that man in the front yard with two gunshot wounds to the leg. This is right near First Avenue and Medelia Street. Officers then got a search warrant for another home in the area. That's where they discovered a fire 
firearm and an improvised explosive device. As of this hour, though, police have still not made any arrests, nor have they identified a suspect. Well, there are still so many questions as we talk about what school is going to look like in the fall. We know that you have questions. We're working hard here at Crime 2 to try to get you some answers. And tonight we are diving into some new guidelines that have just been released about Idaho schools and how that will look. The Board of Education just approved those guidelines this morning. Regina on has been pouring over that document. She joins us now with the latest Regina. Well, Whitney, first off, the board and the governor made it clear today the expectation is that while the school year won't look the same as years past, students will be in classrooms and not and schools are not expected to be closed for extended periods of time. Now, here are some of the key questions these guidelines will address. So do these guidelines mean all Idaho schools will have students in class five days a week? Not necessarily. When there is minimal to substantial spread of the virus happening in a community, it will be up to the local school district to decide if they need any targeted closures, short-term or mid-term closures. School districts can also decide to use a schedule or staggered schedules to allow for a more physical distance between schools. So what happens if there is an outbreak at a school? Who makes that decision to shut down or close the school entirely? Those decisions will be made at the local level, not the state level. School districts will work with their public health district on a case by case basis. Each district is tasked with creating its own plan for tracing and communicating when a student or teacher tests positive. Now it's important to point out that these guidelines released today are just that guidelines. They are not mandates or legally binding. They are simply best practices for Idaho schools to aim for. Coming up at five tonight, we'll answer more questions from these guidelines, including whether masks or face shields are part of the plan to reopen Idaho schools. Regina on Crime 2 News. Governor Jay Inslee is lashing out at the White House on the president's response to reopening schools in the fall. The governor held a coronavirus update today, and one of those topics included the state's plans of students returning to classes this fall. Fall, But Inslee did not hold back after President Trump threatened that he would cut federal funding on schools if they did not reopen. We have seen the White House again uh, threatening to attack our state. And uh, they've really, President has, has picked some uh, peculiar foes to want to have as, as your foes, and that is students and teachers and families. Inslee added he wants to see Washington schools open, but in a safe manner. He is expected to meet with state superintendent next week to discuss progress for the school guidelines in the fall. We'll get to our Spokane numbers here shortly, but first today marks the highest single day spike of new coronavirus cases in North Idaho. So let's take a look. The Panhandle Health District now reporting 97 new cases in the last 24 hours. No new deaths, though, have been reported. Right now, more than 74% of coronavirus cases in North Idaho have been reported in people under the age of 50. Governor Brad Little announced today the state, though, will stay in phase four of reopening until the number of cases goes down. All right, back in Washington now in Spokane County, the Regional Health District reporting almost 2,000 cases, another 53 in the last 24 hours. The Spokane County Health Officer says the county should have a positivity rate of about 2% in order to move forward with more reopening. Right now, though, the county is sitting at about 8% of, of tests are coming back positive. All right, let's take a look at the weather. A little bit cooler today. Today felt, though, um, much warmer than it has over the first part of the summer that we have seen. Tom Sherry, of course, tracking as we get closer to the weekend. All eyes on that, what looks like a really warm Saturday, right, Tom? Oh, boy, it's going to be temperatures close to 90 degrees by the time Saturday rolls around. Let's get right to it. We are seeing some showers that are moving across northeastern Washington and into central Washington. You can see it there on the satellite and radar picture. So we could get a few showers here locally, but it will not be a uh, uh, a, a lot of rain, just a few passing showers. And gosh, it certainly is warm under mostly cloudy skies. 79 degrees. Wind is out of the west southwest at 8 miles per hour. Let's talk about your day planner forecast. Again, 70s with a few uh, possible showers this evening, then partly cloudy overnight and a low of 55. Sunny and warm on Friday with a daytime high of 81 degrees. Here we go for the weekend. We've got 88 on Saturday. Wouldn't you know it? A cool front moves in Saturday night 
tonight into Sunday. We could even see some uh, shower activity develop uh, on Sunday, especially Sunday afternoon. We'll look for a daytime high of 76. It's also going to be windy on Sunday, and that will continue into Monday. Whitney, I'll have a look at your seven day forecast in just about 10 minutes. Always looking forward to it, Tom. Thank you very much. All right, the CEO of Catholic Charities in Eastern Washington facing some criticism tonight after posting a video recently about race and racism within the Catholic Church. You may have already heard or seen this already. Uh, Rob McCann posted a video on YouTube back in June or mid-June. You may have already seen it in the video. He specifically calls his organization and the Catholic Church racist. My Catholic Church and my Catholic Charities organization is racist. How could they not be? Our Catholic faith tradition was built on the premise that a baby born in a manger in the Middle East was a white baby. So how can we be surprised to know that we are a church that must still fight against racism even now? Now, since McCann posted that six and a half minute video, he has received major backlash from the Catholic Church. Now, Bishop Spokane Bishop Thomas Daly is also responding. The bishop released a statement over the weekend saying he met with McCann to talk about that video. In the statement, Bishop Daly wrote that the Black Lives Matter movement conflicts with church teachings. He added, quote, one need not stand with Black Lives Matter to stand for Black Lives. Daly also announced that he is requesting Catholic Charities sponsor a series of speakers to help address the subject of church and race. And McCann has also posted a statement following the backlash. He wrote, quote, as an individual with white privilege, I certainly have had moments where I could and should have done more to be actively anti-racist. I'm not saying that all white people are racist or that all Catholics are racist. I am acknowledging that I need to deeply evaluate my own sin in this area every single day and that I hope others will do the same. And by the way, you can read both of their statements. Just go to our website, creme.com.